thank you, Bhagirath Bhai, for the kind introduction. And would also like to echo the sentiments of the previous speakers, thank Dr. Bansi for getting all of us here. And as usual, organizing a very, uh, both in the academic as well as a non-academic area, a wonderful conference. The task given to me was to talk about what we as the phrologists can do uh, in the, in the ra rapidly increasing scene of diabetes and which eventually leads to chronic kidney disease. So as you're all aware, that uh, the global prevalence of diabetic of the chronic kidney disease is about 843 million patients. And about 40 to 50 percent of these patients are actually because of diabetes. And as since our country is one of the diabetic capitals, it is not surprising that over the years we are going to see large number of patients who will eventually uh, suffer from chronic kidney disease. But the important to note is that though we have a lot of patients with diabetes and who have chronic kidney disease. Not necessarily all of them are having diabetic nephropathy. A small segment will have diabetic nephropathy that they will have persistent proteinuria. But another segment will be having no proteinuria but still have a low GFR, so diabetic kidney disease. And another segment will have diabetes but of a chronic kidney disease of some other etiology. So in a diabetic, whenever you find a, a renal dysfunction or you find proteinuria, think whether it is diabetic nephropathy or other diseases can also coexist. Now, what would be the natural history of most of the patients with diabetic thing? So if you have about 500 odd million patients with it, about 95% are type 2 diabetics. Half of them will eventually develop chronic kidney disease. But the important thing to remember is that out of this half of the patient who develop chronic kidney disease, only 10% actually will reach to the end stage kidney disease because during their journey of the chronic kidney disease, most of them will succumb to cardiovascular disease. So it's very important, though the order of the talk was to initial cardiovascular disease, I'm sure, the to, to, to address both the things, cardiovascular disease as well as the chronic kidney disease. And why it is important to note that is patients who have increased proteinuria in the urine. So if you find normal albumin in the urine is only about 15 milligram in about 24 hours. As your albumin increases in the urine, it is albumin is a very good marker for a microvascular disease. And not only disease in the kidney, but disease in the heart and also in the peripheral vascular disease. So because we can't measure the vascular health in other organs, uh, the uh, urine protein, that is urine albumin, is a very good marker of the vascular health. And our vascular health actually decides how we'll do later on. So any increase in the proteinuria leads to increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Any reduction in the GFR also leads to increased increase incidence of the cardiovascular disease. And all of them would eventually lead to increased mortality. So, but what you can see that despite a lot of theory, a lot of work which has been gone through in the diabetic management, unfortunately, till now, though there has been reduction in the acute myocardial infarction, reduction in the stroke, reduction in the amputation, but the end-stage kidney disease has not really reduced since 1990s uh, due to diabetes. And if you do get an end-stage kidney disease and if you are on dialysis, your mortality is much higher than even most of the prostate cancers or the breast cancer and things like that. So a diagnosis of end-stage kidney disease in a patient with diabetes of type 2 is really is a bad sign. And uh, they would do much worse. The five-year mortality may be as much as about 40%. So what can you do to retard the progression of diabetic kidney disease? So there are several things which you can address now, which you were not able to address earlier. The three key drivers to the progression of diabetic kidney disease is hyperglycemia, which we all can have heard lots about it, that we can address that issue. Then there is a hemodynamic dysregulation, which we have the ACE and ARBs as GLD2 inhibitors, and now we have the new kid on the block, non-steroidal mineral cortical receptor antagonist. And also the inflammation which comes with the diabetic kidney disease can be addressed by some of the drugs which I mentioned on the slide. So I'll briefly talk about the flow will be the, what each of these factors which are listed over here. So first thing is to, as has been repeatedly shown, that if you have, uh, if you have, I, I don't know if this will work, but uh, yeah. uh, if you have, the UK PDS included patients with, who were actually newly diagnosed diabetes, and if you controlled their sugars, they had both reduction in the micro and microvascular complications. But in advanced and accord and VADT studies, they have shown that if you have the late start, then you might have some reduction in the microvascular complication, but not so much in the macrovascular complication. So diabetic memory is very, very important. It has been very well elegantly shown by the previous speakers that it's very, very important. And the second important thing, or I would rather say, in for diabetic kidney disease, is a more important thing than even the glycemic control, the blood pressure control. And there are numerous papers to show that 
the real alteration in the outcome of diabetes kidney disease has been because of the control of blood pressure. Even before the introduction of ACE in ARB, as early as 18, 1989, Parving showed that normally if you have a diabetic patient, the rate of fall of the GFR will be about 10 ml per year, whereas a normal aging, you have a fall of GFR of 1 ml per year. And with good blood pressure control, you can reduce that from 10 ml to about 5 ml, uh, to, if you do it about 140, 90, and can, you can go down as much as 4 ml if you bring the blood pressure down to 130 by 85. Of course, now we have better drugs like ACE and ARBs, so you can use them to reduce and control the blood pressure. Blood pressure control is another key thing for management of diabetic kidney disease. And this algorithm has, as you all very well know, that either if they have proteinuria, that makes sense to use ACE and ARB. If not controlled, then go on to the calcium channel blockers. If not controlled, add a diuretic. And if not, then you can still go further therapies about it. The key thing now is that beyond diabetes and beyond the blood pressure control, do we have therapies which can still retard the progression further? Unfortunately, if you see from the, from the early 2000s to 2020, uh, the, we had, the only therapy which we had was the ACE and ARB. So ACE and ARB came in about 2000s, and they made a big dent in the progression of chronic kidney disease. But from 2000 onwards to 2020, we had several molecules that I drove, like uh, Evocentan, that endothelial antagonist, Perfinidon, that is the TGF-beta, aliskirin, renin inhibitor, silodoxide, which has various mechanisms of action, dual uh, ACE and ARB blockades, and bardolexone. All of them, though they had a very sound science, but they all failed in the clinic. None of them actually showed a beneficial effects. So then, which we now have are the four therapies which are likely to have an impact on the chronic kidney disease. And ACE and ARB, you are all very well aware of. And I'll talk briefly about the SGLT2 inhibitors, the mineral cortical receptor antagonist, and very briefly about GLP-1 receptor agonist. So if you see that, even if you use ACE and ARB, there's a reduction in the, in the uh, chronic kidney disease, but there is a residual risk. So despite using adequate amount of ACE or ARB, you are still left with some residual effect of that. So what do you do next? Next comes the SGLT2 inhibitors. As you all very well know, the SGLT2 inhibitors act on the proximal tubule. They can send the glucose and the sodium down to the macula densa, where they actually cause the efferent arterial vasoconstriction. And they have other effects also. They reduce the weight, they control the blood pressure, they reduce uric acid, and uh, they also reduce the plasma glucose. And of course, because of the efferent arterial constriction, they reduce the intraglomular pressure. So as you all very well know, the ACE and ARB act on the efferent arterial and the SGLT2 inhibitors enter the efferent arterial. Both of them actually reduce the intraglomular hypertension. By reduction in intraglomular hypertension, they have a beneficial effect. And uh, these study drugs were actually studied for CVOT trials, which are already all very well know. They reduce the heart failure, atherosclerotic, cardiovascular, three-point mace, and cardiovascular disease. But along with that, the more important thing was noted was a reduction in the macroalbuminuria, EGFR uh, decline, and in the kidney failure. There are numerous trials. I will not go through all of them. A ton of trials are there to show that. And with each of the therapies, either it be dapagliflozin, either, either it be canagliflozin, or with empagliflozin, all of them have showed a beneficial effect on not only the proteinuria reduction, but also in the rate of progression of the chronic kidney disease and the incidence of end-stage renal failure. Briefly, this is one of the trials with the, with the, with the DAPA CKD trial, which was one of the largest trials in the chronic kidney disease, where they have shown that if you use DAPA gliflozin in, in, in patients with chronic kidney disease, out of which about 70% of the patients had type 2 diabetes, they showed that there was a significant reduction in the renal outcome. So if you treat 19 patients, one patient will have in the three years' time, a reduction in one of the kidney endpoints. So it's very, very important that patients with diabetes and with indications for it should be on dapagliflozin. Now, important to note is that when there are a plethora of trials, what is the right time to introduce a drug so that you have the maximum benefit? So what it has been shown that if you, though in all the drugs, when you start using it much earlier and earlier, the gains are very small. But if you use them later on, the gains are much larger. Because many of the pathophysiological things and the patient who are, are, who are prone to get it are more likely to benefit from SGLT2 inhibitors than using it much early in the game. However, there are other indications to use SGLT2 inhibitors early in the game, and therefore this discussion may be a little relevant. But from the kidney point of view, the absolute reduction in the risk of kidney failure is higher in clinical trials such as credence and DAPA CKD because they used it in patients with established uh, kidney failure, that is, they had some degree of proteinuria or they had reduction in the uh, GFR. Uh, 
Again, there was a lot of feeling that these drugs may cause acute kidney injury, may have several other side effects, but none of them have been shown, at least in the trials, both the last trials, the DAPA CKD trial and the CREDENCE trial. Important note is these trials and these drugs don't come without side effects, so there are some sick-day rules which you need to remember that if you're using SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, they, should be hold, which they should be held if there is any sickness, if they're going for surgery, if they're going for sh short surgery, you may hold it for a day, if they're going for long surgery, you may hold it for a couple of days because you can get uh, significant alteration in the hemodynamics which you do not want around the perioperative period. They can get sometimes, if they're fasting, then they can get diabetic ketoacidosis, which you do not want. So these drugs, excellent drugs, good drugs to use, but always remember some of the problems which come along with these drugs. But if you can see here that despite the, the renal study showed that, that there was a residual risk, the credence study, that is that if you add canalis group from the ACE and ARB, still there was a residual risk. And with the DAPA CKD, still there's a residual risk. So still patients will progress with chronic kidney disease, will progress eventually to end-stage renal failure. So can we address this problem further? So here comes a new drug, which is known as a fenrenone. Fenrenone is a, a non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. It is a little different from the aldosterone uh, antagonist, pyranolactone, because it is a very bulky molecule. It acts such that it recruits certain different genes which are, which are silenced compared to that which happens with pyranolactone. So the risk of hyperkalemia is much lower, and the risk of gynecomastia is also lower. And on the effect side, its effect on the blood pressure is much lower compared to spironolactone. So though it is a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, three differences, less hyperkalemia, less gynecomastia and other effects, and but also less reduction in the blood pressure. Therefore, this drug has been especially has a lot of anti-inflammatory effect. So one of the problems of diabetes and heart failure is that there is some degree of inflammation which this drug tries to address. What about the trials in that? So we have the Fidelio and the Figaro trial. I just discussed very briefly of the Fidelio trial, which showed that if you use them in patients with proteinuria and you use them in stage 3 CKD uh, in this group of patients, you find that there is a reduction in the outcome. That is, if you use about 29 patients you treat at three years, one of the events will be reduced. So they have reduction in the kidney failure or sustained reduction in the GFR or the renal death. So these are good drugs which are coming up and they have already been launched, I think last week or two weeks ago, they've been launched in the country also. So what, and this just shows that there is an increase in the, in the potassium as it expected with the drug, but the increase is not significant as to cause withdrawal of the therapy or to require any admission or any treatment for it. The GLP-1 receptor agonist is the last drug uh, which the kidney trials are not so many of them, but they do have some beneficial nephroprotective effects. And they also have effects on the obesity, they have effects on, uh, on uh, many other parameters of inflammation also, and uh, they can be introduced very early in the game. They have less hypoglycemic effects, so, and they can be used with the GFR uh, for, uh, as much as much as up to the, with the patient up to reaches of dialysis. So that way they are safe for the kidney, and therefore there are many surrogate trials or trials which are trying to look at it. One of the trials which I just brought your attention is the AWARD-7 trial, which showed that if you compare dulaglutide with insulin glargine, there is a reduction in the macroalbuminuria. But we have to await to see really very big trials coming in, and there are some trials on the way which will address this issue also. So what drugs should come in first, second, third, and the fourth? So if there are indications, of course, SGL2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, you'll use up front. But which should come next and which should come later on? Uh, should they come as they were discovered and introduced into practice, or should they be based on the pathophysiology? All of us would love to base it on the pathophysiology. So there is going to be some competition between SGLT2 inhibitors and MR androgonists, but SGLT2 inhibitors already, as I said, they have an hypoglycemic effect, so they may come in first, and then the MRA antagonist. And depending upon the indication, it can be used. There are not many trials actually adding both together, but there are some trials on the way which will tell us later on what's the beneficial effect with both of them combined together. So, in effect, in a sense, if you have a patient with diabetes and if he has even a moderately increase, that is what was previously known as microalbuminuria, you need to start treatment for them, control the blood pressure with ACE or ERB. If under adequate control of that, still there is a residual proteinuria remaining, you add an SGLT2 inhibitor if not added, and then later on you can add uh, the drug that is the MRA antagonist if still not uh, uh, controlled adequately. So in brief, uh, this is something which is in the draft, but I thought I'll share with you. So after the good things that you do with the lifestyle thing, what is the first line therapy? The SGLT2 inhibitors along with the metformin with the first line therapy, if the GFR is more than 30 ml. If not adequately controlled, you can add the GLP-1 receptor 
uh, agonist and uh, still if needed, and if we have proteinuria, you use first the RAS inhibitors, and still the proteinuria is continuing, then you can add, if they are not an SGL2 inhibitors, add the MRA, MRA antagonist, and of course, if the blood pressure is not well controlled, you add a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic to them. And of course, you can also take care of the lipids, uh, which uh, uh, really have a role to play in this therapy. So overall, we try to look at both the cardiovascular as well as the, the kidney parameters. And fortunately, a lot of drugs have combined effect on both heart and the kidney, and they, they would really do well for your patients. I think I will stop here, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to.